Good morning, everyone. My name is Cynthia Norris. Um, thank you today for joining us for the data management and sharing workshop. Um, I am the lead for science, tech, science and technology within the research development team, and we are housed in the office of the VP of Research. Our presentation today will be led by Dr. Nick Roosh from University Libraries. We are fortunate to have him as a research data management librarian, and he has expertise in all things related to data management and sharing plans. So we're very excited to have him here today. Uh, next slide, please. And just a shameless plug for my uh, the office that I'm within, um, the research development team is a little different from other teams that you might be familiar with, such as sponsored research or IRB, but we are all, are all within the same office. With the research development team, we are um, focused on supporting faculty with developing competitive um, grant proposals um, for funding their research. So with there being new uh, federal requirements to include data management plans um, within as a component of uh, grant proposals, this is definitely within our wheelhouse. Um, so again, thank you for that. Again, research development team. And for the workshop today, we have a larger group. So we ask that everyone just please put their questions in the chat um, and um, we'll get to them one by one. And we have set aside, set aside time for questions and answers. And again, thank you everyone for um, just providing questions beforehand, beforehand if you were able to. Um, those questions will also be addressed throughout the presentation. Um, and today's workshop will be recorded and the PowerPoint will be shared on our on-demand learning page. And without any other delay, I will hand it over to Dr. Roosh. All right, thank you, Cynthia, for that introduction and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining this morning. Um, as Cynthia said, I am uh, Nick Grush. I'm the Research Data Management Librarian at FSU Libraries. Um, and today we are going to go over um, the data management um, guidelines, some general information, some resources for filling out your data management plans um, as you're thinking about uh, those for either your grant applications or how your lab or uh, center um, can sort of meet all of these guidelines that are coming out from the different funding agencies. Um, and as Cynthia said, um, thank you to those that submitted questions ahead of time. Um, some of those will be addressed as we go throughout the workshop. Um, some of them will be addressed towards the end, um, and we will have time for any Q&A from today's session um, at the end of the workshop. Uh, so just a brief overview of what I am going to go through today. I'm going to start off with some definitions and some background of some of the terminology around data and data management. We'll then go into um, memos from the OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, that has led to a lot of these uh, data management guidelines and funder requirements. I'll then go over funder requirements a little more generally, um, what typically goes into a data management plan. I'll provide some examples from a few different funding agencies, um, such as NSF, H. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, some things that come up when you are thinking about data management, data management planning, um, such as data documentation, uh, storage, and archival. Um, and then the last part of the session, we'll talk about some resources and tools for crafting your data management and sharing plans. So I like to start off by um, providing a definition for research data, specifically within the context um, of um, these public access mandates and these funder guidelines. Um, you know, whenever we're uh, doing research, everybody's got a little bit different idea or a little bit different definition of data, what they think of data. Um, this definition um, from the Code of Federal Regulations um, is directly cited in a lot of the OSTP memos. Um, and so we'll be um, using this as our definition for data today. Um, and so they define data as the recorded factual material commonly accepted in the scientific community as necessary to validate research findings. 
Now, when we think about data um, and doing that in the context of research, um, data sort of goes through a um, life cycle, as I like to call it, um, throughout the research process. Um, now, as we know, um, research is not often linear. It's not nice and in a straight line or in a circular line like this visual depicts. Um, but this sort of provides a nice visual for the different components of the research life cycle. Um, and you'll see that data management is really in the center. So it's really important across the entire uh, research data life cycle. Um, so creating a plan for how you're going to manage that data throughout all of those different steps, all of those different parts of the cycle um, at the beginning of your project is really important. Now, when we think about research data, um, there are many, many different types of research data. Um, all of these, um, if you're producing them, um, should be noted somewhere in a data management plan. Um, these are quite varied. Um, we have on the left examples such as text documents, spreadsheets, questionnaires, um, images, spectra, etc. Um, but you'll notice on the right, um, there's also documentation, right? Documents that you might produce throughout um, that research process. So things like methodologies, workflows, standard operating procedures, protocols. Um, you know, these are also important components of that process. Um, they um, sort of help with replicability, reproducibility of that data. Um, so these are um, things that should also be included um, or noted in a data management plan. And we'll talk about where and how as we go along. Now, this slide um, sort of titled, What is Not Research Data? And these are documents that are um, often produced throughout the research process. Um, they're important components of the research process, but they're not necessarily considered data products um, or required for DMPs by the different funding agencies. Um, and if you look at sort of like the NIH guidelines, for example, or some of the other agency guidelines, they'll usually note what kind of products um, are not required to be noted for a data management plan. Um, and that's where these come from. And most of these examples fall under like plans and communications, um, both internally or externally with colleagues. Um, you know, such as plans for future research, um, communication with colleagues, um, or any other general notes that you take during the research project. Um, so these are things that will likely produce, they're important, but do not necessarily have to be noted on the data management plans that you are filling out. All right, so we talk a little bit about data. Um, so now let's define what research data management is and what we mean by that. Um, so research data management um, concerns data organization throughout the entire um, data research lifecycle, um, starting all the way from ideation when you um, are first planning a project um, and data collection all the way to archival and reuse. Um, so it includes all of those processes um, that you may do during a research project um, to create that organized, documented, accessible, and reusable um, research data. Um, and it ensures that the results of the scholarship are reproducible and verifiable by other future scholars in the field. So properly managing your data throughout a project um, is going to save you a lot of time and a lot of resources um, by really encouraging those good organization and quality control practices 
Um, and this can be important when you need to locate past data. You know, maybe you're um, at the end of your current grant and you're trying to renew that grant or you're writing a report for that grant and you need to access some of the data that you produced as part of that project. Um, so having a um, data management plan and a plan for how you're gonna work with your data can really help save you time and resources in that sense. Uh, data management enhances reproducibility by making the methodology more transparent um, to others in the research community. Um, it encourages researchers to consider data backup, data security, and data privacy measures um, from the onset and sort of throughout the project. Um, and it ensures that the data is preserved and archived um, in addition to that data being stored. Um, so when we think about preservation, that's sort of focusing on the long-term ability to access and use that data and considers things like interoperability um, and open or universal file formats. And then um, the last part, uh, the part we'll sort of focus on um, a bit today, um, data management plans and data sharing um, is often required um, of researchers when you're applying for funding from uh, both federal and private funding agencies. And that's sort of a nice segue into um, the next couple of slides. Um, so a lot of these data management and sharing guidelines um, stem from a couple of memos that have been released over the last decade or so um, by the Office of Science and Technology Policy or OSTP. Uh, the first of those was released in 2013. Um, it's often referred to as um, the Holdren Memo, um, named after Eric Holdren, who was the director of OSTP at that time. And these requirements um, applied specifically to um, peer-reviewed publications and digital data that resulted from uh, federally funded research. And it required all agencies that received over $100 million in annual um, R&D expenditures to develop guidelines to support increased public access to the results of research um, funded by the federal government. And this included or necessitated developing guidelines for um, research data management planning. And all data, um, digitally formatted scientific data supported wholly or in part by federal funding um, needed to be stored um, in a way that it could be publicly accessible to search, retrieve, and analyze. Now, this memo um, was built upon in uh, 2022 with the release of another memo from OSTP. Um, this one is often known as the Nelson Memo um, by doc from Dr. Alondor Nelson, who was then the acting director of OSTP. And this advanced a lot of um, substantial and significant um, changes to the Holdren Memo, really sort of built on that. Um, so the updates in this were that now um, all federal funding agencies, not just those with that $100 million in annual R&D expenditures, um, are required to either create, if they don't have them already, um, or update plans that support um, public access to research. Um, it eliminates the 12-month embargo period for publications. Um, publications are to be made publicly available immediately upon publication. Um, and then in terms of data, um, in addition to the data associated with publications, 
um, requires the agencies to develop guidelines for sharing uh, federally funded research data that is not associated with a peer-reviewed publication. Um, so these guidelines um, are still being developed. Um, the agencies were given time to um, sort of develop the first draft of their guidance, solicit feedback, um, and they are still going through that whole process. Um, so you may see um, this year and next year, you may see some of the agencies releasing new guidance or soliciting feedback on some of these guidelines. Um, the agencies are required to finalize and implement their updated plans by the end of 2025. All right, so now I wanna talk a little bit about um, what some of those guidelines actually are and sort of what goes into those. Um, so while the guidance does vary a little bit between the funding agency and even the directorates um, within the funding agencies and the discipline, um, most data management plans have somewhat similar requirements um, with slightly different ways of how they might want that information to be addressed. Um, so most data management plans are usually about two pages. Um, that can vary depending on the agency. Um, I do actually have an example in a few slides where that is not the case, um, but in most cases they are usually around two pages, um, part of that grant proposal. And they generally um, address um, things like um, where and how the data will be archived for later use, um, how the data will be shared in meeting those uh, data sharing guidelines, um, information on any sort of data privacy, copyright, or intellectual property concerns. This can be really important if you're working with sensitive data or data involving human subjects. Data documentation, so types, the formats, um, sort of documentation on where another researcher could find information about the data or data sets that you're working with, um, the data types um, and the file formats, um, and then any sort of information on data security, um, data encryption, if that is necessary, um, and then how you are storing and backing up that data. So those are kind of general characteristics of most data management plans. Um, I'm now going to go into um, a couple of specific agencies um, and talk about their guidance in a little bit more detail. Uh, so the first is the uh, National Science Foundation. Um, so the National Science Foundation um, has released guidance and has actually updated their guidance fairly recently um, for preparing a data management and sharing plan. Um, and you can find more information on that at the link um, that's provided at the bottom. And we will provide uh, these slides and all of the links in here. So you'll be able to go back and kind of browse through some of this information later. Um, now, some NSF directorates um, do have additional guidance or more specific guidance tailored to their areas. Um, if you um, do research under the NSF, you'll know that there are many, many directorates, um, sort of depending on your discipline, um, research area, um, and I don't have time to go through every single one of those. Um, but there are links to information um, from the different directorates. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions on specific ones or follow up on that later on. Um, 
But most NSF DMPs um, typically will ask, um, unless they specify otherwise, um, for um, the information that's shown here on the slide. Um, so they'll ask for information on the types of data, uh, samples, physical collections, software, curriculum materials, or any other materials that are to be produced during the course of the research project. Um, they'll ask for the standards to be used for the data and the metadata or data documentation, um, ask for the format of that. Um, if there are cases where there aren't standards for that particular field or the existing standards aren't adequate for the research project, um, this should be documented or noted in this section of the plan. Um, some disciplines are at different places in sort of developing these um, different standards for how they um, sort of document their data. Um, policies or plans for data access and sharing. Um, so how you plan to share this data, um, you know, once you have published or at the conclusion of the grant. Um, and then if there are any provisions in here for data privacy or confidentiality, um, intellectual property rights, um, et cetera, that would be included um, in this particular section. Um, and then policies and provisions for data reuse, redistribution, and the production of derivatives. Um, and then finally, plans for archiving data, samples, and other research products, and for preserving access to them. Um, so again, as I said, um, these are sort of the general guidelines. You'll see the directorates maybe go into a little bit more detail on what this means for these different specific sections and their specific areas. Uh, some of them might add a component or two, um, but this information is pretty standard across most of the NSF um, DMSPs. Now, another agency um, that I want to talk a little bit about is the NIH. Um, and if you work with NIH um, data or have applied to um, the NIH in the last year, year and a half or so, you know that they um, released their updated uh, DMSP guidance, um, which took effect in January of 2023. Um, and NIH DMSPs um, are asked to include um, six elements, and that includes um, data type. So the types of data um, that you are working with, the file formats um, for that data, um, any sort of data documentation that you are working with, um, related tools, software, and code. Um, so if there are specialized tools that are needed to access some of the data that you are working with, um, those should be included here. Um, and it's not a bad idea to include those um, for an NSF uh, DMSP either. Um, any sort of metadata or data documentation standards, um, data preservation, access, and associated timelines. Um, access, distribution, or reuse considerations, so anything that might affect um, distribution or reuse or access to that data. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what this means in a few slides, because um, this does kind of go along um, with sort of the data privacy and confidentiality um, concerns that the NSF also talks about. Um, and then oversight of data management and sharing. Um, so sort of who um, is responsible for making sure that the data management plan is being followed. Um, this is often the PI um, on the grant, 
Um, but this may also include details um, in case the PI leaves the group or something else happens who would take over oversight of the data management and sharing plan. All right, one other agency that I do want to touch on, this was a question actually that came in before the workshop, um, was the um, IES or the Institute of Educational um, Sciences. Um, so this one has a little bit more information or at least the information is sort of broken out into more sections, but most of it is the same. Um, and you'll note, um, that they asked for their DMPs to be no more than five pages. Um, so their guidelines are a little different. Um, but again, they sort of ask for information on the type of data to be shared, um, privacy, confidentiality, um, sort of data formats. Um, they do ask about data sharing agreements. So if there are any data sharing agreements that are applicable for that data um, to include information on that. Um, and then method of data sharing format of the final data set. Uh, so it's fairly similar information, just sort of broken out into um, more sections. And as I said, there are a lot of different agencies, a lot of different directorates. Um, we'll provide some links at the end um, and some resources for finding information on specific ones. Um, but those are just some kind of representative examples. And as you can sort of see, a lot of them have fairly similar information that they're looking for. Um, they may just package it or structure it in a little bit different way. Um, so I did want to touch briefly on um, FSU's data management policy. Um, so FSU is a university, um, has adopted a uh, research data management policy as well. Um, that took effect in 2016, so a couple years after that first OSTP memo. Um, and this outlines the responsibilities of the university and the PI uh, related to uh, research data, um, along with um, things like ownership, uh, collection and retention, uh, data security, publication and access, um, et cetera. Um, sort of the main things to note from that um, you know, is that the PI is the uh, steward of the um, data collected as part of the project um, and is responsible for ensuring that the data is um, public as mandated by um, the different funding agencies. So making sure that those funding agency guidelines are followed. Um, the data is ultimately the property of the university. Um, although there are considerations as well for um, collaborations um, or work that's done as part of a consortium or folks outside the institution as well. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that link. Um, it provides some more information and the most current um, policy um, that's in effect. All right, so that was some information on the different guidelines um, from some of the funding agencies um, and from FSU uh, when it comes to uh, what information should be included in your data management and sharing plans. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about a few of the specific um, items that were included in those um, guidelines and sort of talk about um, what that means. Um, and the first one is uh, data documentation. Um, so you heard me mention data documentation and metadata a few times when we were talking through those guidelines. Um, so when we're talking about data documentation, um, this is 
descriptive information about a data set that explains its meaning and really enables other users to find, understand, um, and use that data. Um, so examples of this include things like uh, readme files, uh, code books, or data dictionaries, um, research methodologies, file directories, etc. Um, so these are really important when considering um, reproducibility and reusability um, of the data set, um, sort of enables researchers, um, other researchers to find information about the data that you've produced, um, you know, and how that was produced, methodologies that have been used, et cetera. Access, distribution, and reuse. Um, so there are certain factors that are defined by some of the funding agencies. Um, um, these come from the NIH, but they can also be considered um, in some ways um, for NSF as well. Um, and these are really things that might affect the access, distribution, and reuse of scientific data. Um, and this includes things like informed consent, um, if there are any privacy and confidentiality protections um, consistent with any federal, tribal, state, or local laws or regulations, um, whether you're doing, say, human subjects data and um, whether access to scientific data derived from humans will be controlled, what measures are in place um, to ensure um, privacy and confidentiality of participants, um, any restrictions that are imposed by those laws or regulations that I mentioned before. Um, if you are doing any NIH research um, that might be subject to the GDS or the Genomic Data Sharing Policy, um, they do have some exceptions um, lined up for data sharing. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at those for more specifics um, and any other considerations that may limit the extent of data sharing. Um, and the funding agencies will usually have um, guidelines or sort of a list of you know, different considerations um, that will come into place. Um, and if the data that you are producing um, kind of falls under these um, specific guidelines or reasons, um, you know, these may be reasons to sort of limit what data is shared and you would include that information in the data management and sharing plan that you write. All right, so the next thing I want to um, touch on are data repositories. So we talked about data sharing a little bit and sharing your data, um, you know, either when you um, publish um, an article or you're at the conclusion of your grant, um, you often will archive that data in something called a data repository. Um, so these repositories um, help archive and curate data um, in a way that sort of meets those different public access guidelines um, and also in a way that is FAIR. Um, so there's this FAIR acronym um, that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and essentially um, what this means is that the data and any sort of supplementary materials or documentation um, have sufficiently rich metadata. Um, they have unique or persistent identifiers. Um, the metadata and the data is understandable to humans and to machines. Um, it's deposited in a trusted repository. Um, the metadata uses a sort of formal, um, broadly applicable language um, for knowledge representation. Um, and then 
data has sort of clear usage guidelines um, and provides, you know, any sort of accurate information on provenance. Um, so that's sort of what it means to um, deposit your data in a way that's fair and these repositories sort of facilitate that. Um, now there are several types of data repositories that may be appropriate. Uh, depends a lot on the research project, the type of data that you're working with, how much data that you're working with. Um, but um, some of the most common ones uh, are uh, discipline specific, generalist or institutional repositories. Um, so discipline specific, um, it's kind of what it sounds like. These are repositories that are um, sort of designed to um, archive and make publicly available research from a particular discipline or research area. Um, so these are often um, community developed um, and you'll find them for many, many different research areas. Um, there's a really good site um, to sort of find more information um, on discipline specific repositories. Um, this is called Read 3 Data or the Registry of Research Data Repositories. Um, and this site will allow you to sort of search through kind of a database, if you will, um, you know, of different data repositories for different disciplines um, that will sort of meet those data sharing guidelines. Um, generalist repositories, um, these are data repositories that um, are multidisciplinary, so they take data from a variety of research areas, not just one specific discipline. Um, so these can be good if your discipline does not have a data repository or there's not a repository appropriate for um, that specific data type or research area. Um, you can consider a generalist repository. Um, so these are things like um, Figshare or Dataverse or Dryad, et cetera. And then the third one is an institutional repository. Um, so this is a repository that's stood up by an academic institution or university um, to house research um, by researchers at that institution. Um, so at FSU, we have a research repository called Digital. Um, and this is a place, you know, if your data uh, meets um, certain criteria, you know, if it's, um, you know, can be shared here, um, an institutional repository is also an option. Uh, but these are sort of the um, most common types of repositories. Um, sometimes when you are doing your writing up your grant and you look at sort of those um, grant solicitations, sometimes it will specify a repository um, for your specific area. So it'll tell you, go and publish your data in this repository once, you know, the grant you're at grant closeout or when you publish. Um, so sometimes it's really easy, um, but a lot of times they won't specify a repository and you'll need to um, sort of find one that's appropriate um, for the project. Um, so that's where um, some of these sites, some of these other repositories come into play. Um, and if you're working with NIH data, um, you know, they do have tips for selecting a um, data repository, um, which can be um, can be useful um, if you're still kind of unsure of um, where to go, where to share that data. All right, um, data storage and backup. Um, so it is really important to um, sort of back up your data regularly over the course of a project um, to um, prevent data loss um, from any sort of accidents that might happen. Um, 
as we all know, technology is going to have fits, right? Um, no matter what we do. Um, so it's really important to have backup plans and to store that data in um, several different locations, kind of come up with a plan for how you're going to monitor that data, um, you know, and really do this before you collect any data, ideally, um, really at the beginning of the project. Um, a general rule of thumb is um, the three to one rule. Um, so keep three copies um, of your data files um, in at least two different locations um, with at least one of those copies being off-site. Um, we say two different locations um, just because something could happen at a specific location. Um, so if you have your data um, housed on like a lab computer and, you know, another device uh, within the same building, if something happens to that um, building, um, both of those locations, um, you may lose the data from there. Um, so that's why we say at least two different locations um, and ideally one being offsite or maybe in cloud storage, um, et cetera. Um, you'll want to back up often. Um, set a schedule that works for you, works for your research group, um, and sort of follow through with it. Um, there's no like hard and fast to this. It really depends on how much data that you're working with, how much that you're producing, um, you know, how often that data is being updated or you're generating new data sets. Um, but really sort of figure out a schedule that works for you, works for your group, um, make sure everyone knows what that is, um, and then follows that. So when thinking about different data storage options, um, there are a lot of different storage options. Um, each one sort of has different uh, benefits and drawbacks. Um, there's no sort of one size fits all. Um, you know, and those um, data storage options, you know, may be different if, say, you're working in your own research group or if you are um, managing a facility that um, is working with data from a lot of different researchers, um, you know, sort of um, where you store that data and for how long might differ. Um, so there are some things though, when you are um, storing data that you will want to consider. Um, and that includes things like data protection, you know, so how um, do you protect the integrity of that data, the access to that data and the system that holds that data, um, you know, the confidentiality um, kind of levels that you have to think about with that data, you know, so is the data, non-sensitive, moderately sensitive, or highly sensitive, um, the ease of access, you know, how important is it to be able to easily access that data, um, collaborators, you know, do other researchers need to be able to access or archive that data, um, you know, are they at your home institution, are they at another institution, um, how much data are you working with? You know, are you working with, you know, five megabytes or are you working with five terabytes, right? You know, so how much data are you working with? Um, does all of it need to be immediately accessible or can some of it be archived in a place that maybe isn't as accessible, um, you know, that you can look at later on? Um, so um, these are sort of some considerations. Um, you know, and then often a lot of the storage options, you know, are sort of divided into things like networked options, cloud options, desktop options. Um, so really sort of thinking what works um, best for you and your particular research group. All right, so now I'll sort of move into the last part of the workshop. Um, I'll go through this fairly quickly. So we do have a few minutes for questions at the end. 
Um, so one resource that is really great for working um, on DMPs, building DMPs, is something called the DMP tool or data management plan tool. Um, this was a resource developed in response um, to these initial uh, mandates and OSTP memo from 2013. Um, it's maintained by the California Digital Library um, with data librarians and other experts contributing expertise and time uh, to make sure those resources are updated and current. Um, the great thing about it is that it provides templates um, that you can use to craft a data management plan. Um, and those templates are designed around guidance from the different funding agencies and provide links to um, agency resources or sometimes institutional resources um, that um, researchers can reference when creating plans. Um, FSU is a member institution of the DMP tool, um, so anybody um, at FSU um, can create and save um, a plan, um, sort of update and invite collaborators. Um, and plans can also be, plans developed by the tool can also be connected um, with an ORCID um, using their DMP ID system. So this slide has links to several example data management plans um, from the NSF and NIH specifically. Um, if you go to the DMP tool, um, you'll see sort of at the top of the page, they have um, something called their public plans page, um, which is where plans that other researchers have written. Um, some of those have been made publicly available by the different DMP tool users. Um, some of them are also featured um, or ones that have sort of been selected by um, other data experts or DMP tool folks um, as sort of exemplar plans or examples that you can look at. Um, so I link some um, specific ones um, here in the slide that I think are um, really useful. Um, and again, you'll see all of these links when you um, get the slide. Um, these are some other DMP tools and resources. Um, I've talked about some of these already. So things like the DMP tool, um, or Re3Data. Um, there's also the Open Science Framework, which is sort of a project management um, tool where you can sort of manage and document all the different parts of your uh, research process. Um, we have developed a data management guide um, that's on our FSU Libraries webpage that has sort of more information um, and links to specific repositories or storage options that you can consider. Um, and then there are some links from the different funding agencies um, for um, guidance for their data management and sharing policies as well. All right, and then I'm at the library, so I would be remiss if I didn't put in a plug for the libraries as well. Um, so we provide um, several services for researchers that are creating uh, data management plans or wish to improve their data management um, skill set. Um, and some of these include um, things like one on one or group consultations with um, myself. Um, or another FSU data librarian um, instruction or workshops such as this one um, on funder guidelines or uh, building a data management plan, data documentation, data storage, and archival. So some of those things that I kind of um, just briefly covered um, later in the workshop, I can actually do some kind of more deep dive trainings um, into those specific areas. Um, and then we can also assist uh, with selecting and finding a data repository, um, selecting an appropriate data storage option, 
um, or help me with some of these tools. Um, a lot of times, you know, when looking at data repositories or data storage options, these are um, very specific to specific research projects or researchers. So everybody's situation is going to be a little different. There's not always sort of a one size fits all solution. So um, I always like to sort of sit down, talk with folks, kind of see what your needs are, and we can kind of come up with a plan that works best um, for your research. All right. And then finally, um, you know, we do not do this alone. Um, there are other folks on campus that also um, assist with various parts of the research process, answer questions, um, things related to data management or data compliance um, or human subjects work. Um, so our um, colleagues at the Office of Research Development who had me here today um, can answer some of those questions. Um, Office of Research Compliance, if you have any IRB or compliance related questions, um, or if you have any questions related to um, human subjects work. Um, um, lots of folks um, can help out. You know, we sort of collaborate with one another to sort of get your questions answered and make sure um, that we help you the best we can. All right. And with that, I'll just put my um, contact information up um, so that um, if you have any questions after today or if we don't get to your question um, before we finish, um, you can always uh, feel free to reach out to me. Always happy to meet with you one-on-one um, -on -one or with your group um, and talk about some of this information in a little more detail. All right. Thank you, Nick. We do have a few more questions for you. Um, so one of the questions is, do you consider GitHub to be an acceptable repository, especially if data do not need to be protected or are not confidential? Yes, um, GitHub is often um, considered acceptable, you know, especially if you're working with um, like code data or if that data, like you said, doesn't need to be um, protected. Um, so yes, GitHub, um, is acceptable. I have seen researchers use that as part of their data management and sharing plans. Okay. And then um, someone asked, can you give an example or two of what standards would look like from the slide titled NSF um, DSMB um, guidance? I'm guessing the directorate um, differences on that one. Um, yeah. So, I mean, those uh, the different standards are sort of, um, you know, the the fields that you might use um, within the data and how you might represent that or like the different ontologies that you might use. So ways that you would um, classify the variables or define the different variables um, within that data. Um, so if, you know, you're um, working with um, say like biology data, for example, you know, like how, how you would define those different variables, um, how you would classify those. Um, some, some disciplines will have very well-defined um, standards and guidelines for that um, and sort of what fields that you might use within that data. Um, and I do have a link somewhere um, that links to some of those different standards. And I can find that and sort of add that into this presentation so that you can kind of see more examples. Um, but that's sort of what I'm referring to when I refer to um, standards for that metadata. OK. Um, next question is, you mentioned the PI is responsible for the um, data management sharing plan, but what is the role of the core shared facilities where um, the vast majority of data um, are generated and stored? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. Um, and I, I did receive a similar question before the workshop. Um, so this is a great segue to that. Um, so in terms of um, the core facilities, um, that the responsibilities there sort of will depend on um, sort of 
how the core facility is being funded. Um, if it is a sort of user basis where like a PI is um, submitting um, a sample to be analyzed, um, you know, and is paying some sort of a user fee from their grants. Um, the PI is the one that's ultimately responsible for the data, um, even though like the core facility will still be storing that data um, for a specific amount of time. Um, the agencies don't really specify, um, you know, specifically for a facility, um, but typically, you know, however long that that data has to be stored, you know, by the PI, that's also usually a pretty good um, standard. Um, you know, if the facility is receiving direct funding, you know, if they're receiving their own funding from the NIH, the NSF, or any other agency, um, it's going to um, sort of depend on whatever guidelines are, um, you know, specified within those, um, you know, data, those calls, essentially. Um, so the amount of time that it needs to be stored can vary. Um, you know, there are some FSU options for um, data storage through ITS. Um, there's some other options I think they're considering, um, you know, but I think it'll also differ between the different facilities as well. Um, and I'm happy to sort of um, kind of talk more specifically, um, you know, if you have, you know, specific questions for your facilities or for other facilities as well. Um, but that's a really good question. And just to add to that, um, so with like, so, so example for NSF, um, I looked at their PAPG and the lead organization is required to uh, submit a data management sharing plans, but the non-lead organization is not. Um, but even with that, you still want to consider how involved are you in the data management collection process? That just might be something that you um, kind of, you know, flesh out when you first start um, collaborating with somebody. All right, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, let's see. It says, what are the NIH guidelines for sharing qualitative data such as transcripts of in-depth interviews and focus groups, especially for sensitive topics? Yeah, I think in um, those situations, um, you know, if there's any sort of um, sensitive or identifiable information um, within that data, um, they um, ask that you try and de-identify that data. Um, so using any sort of de-identification protocols um, that are typically used in that field or that area. Um, you know, if there are situations where you know, de-identifying that, you know, is it possible or doing that, you know, there's some reason that that isn't possible. You know, they they do have situations where you can, you know, kind of share um, different version of that or not share that data. Um, but um, sort of, um, I'm not sure if they um, go into super specifics on that, but I do know they talk a lot about like sort of um, qualitative data or data, you know, where there are, are identifiers or um, anything that might sort of identify the participants. So definitely de-identifying that data um, is something um, that they ask. Uh, so you would not want to share sort of the raw data in that instance.